this is so painful. I'm doing it again. This is my third attempt at making this video. I recorded it last night, late at night, like at 11 o'clock at night after my, my whole family had gone to bed. And then I, that one didn't work out. So I woke up this morning and my second attempt was a beautiful, perfect recording of this video, but still I had technical errors and it didn't work out. So here we are trying it again. I get people writing me all the time saying that they like my research, but they wish I made videos that were more, you know, special effects, visuals, and so on and so forth. Well, I present these videos the way I do because I'm a writer and I prefer reading. And so uh, I love the experience of writing, just being alone in a room and letting my thoughts flow out onto the page. And so I would just prefer just reading off one of my own papers and letting you guys either read along on the screen or, you know, just listen. So with that, hopefully this will be third time's the charm. This is called The Narnia Reset, of course, by yours truly, Noel Joshua Hadley. Just yesterday, I wrote a paper on the multiverse as it pertains to science fiction writer Philip K. Dick. And the very first Mandela Effect which just so happens to be the long-lost millennial kingdom of Yahusha HaMashiach. It's a little bit more complicated than that. We're talking about the multiverse as well, a plurality of worlds. It's the one where, amazingly, much of what I've been researching over the last few years has unexpectedly come together. You can read about it here, the first Mandela effect. There's a link, but you can. I think it's the last video I put up on YouTube. It shouldn't be too hard to find. I'm not really sure why I'm bringing that up now, except to say that two weeks of writer's block had finally been defeated. And guys, writer's block is the absolute worst. If you've ever gone through it before and you you feel like your entire world is coming to an end. I mean, that may seem a little overdramatic, but what writer's block essentially is, is you're not able to organize your thoughts. And this is why the writing process is so difficult for a lot of people because they have a hard time organizing you know, these words into a sentence and making it interesting. And then you, you organize one sentence and you're like, man, I've got to do that now another, you know, so many hundreds of times. All that to say the smokestacks are smoking again. The Oompa Loompas are writing their songs. I'm talking about inside my head. I am happy to report that the cogwheels have continued turning even while on the pillow last night. And all I could think about when flipping the coffee pot on this morning were other long overdue projects, such as this one. FYI, I have stacks of unfinished homework assignments which need tending to. This particular paper began an entire year ago, and I still don't know what to call it. I suppose we will simply go with the Narnia Reset, though I aim to keep you on your toes as to the final title. I might change it at any time. As you know, I am always on the lookout for clues regarding the Millennial Kingdom as having already physically happened upon the green earth. Good times, I'm already on to another one, another clue. Every so often, I like to turn in a book report, and it is in The Magician's Nephew, the sixth book in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia series, though the publishers have all the kids today thinking it was the first to be written. When I was a child, it was like... you. You had one through seven, and it was number six. Now it's number one. And anyways, it's in the sixth book of The Magician's Nephew where we find our latest evidence mound. Perhaps it will be a mountain or only turn out to be a molehill. That is for you, the reader or the listener, to decide. It all adds up, though. It is not my intent to go over every detail of the story. That would be ridiculous and probably copyright infringement. You will have to read the stories for yourself if every little plot point is what you're after. And in fact, that's not my intent in going through this. I'm going to leave out a lot of plot details for sake of time. Speaking of which, I am including many illustrations from original Narnia artist Pauline Baines. Last I checked, they have yet to enter the public domain. Maybe they have. I don't know. But we are all adults here, aren't we? Fair use laws allows me to commit the deed in the name of criticism, scholarship, and research, which is what we are doing here. The two children in the story are Diggory and Polly. Spoiler alert, 
and Diggory grows up to become the professor in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Well, here is the short of the story that we're looking at. It is one of the wettest and coldest summers on record, and the two children live in a row of townhomes within the jurisdiction of London, all of which have attics connected by a long, dark tunnel. The tunnel is described for us as having a brick wall on one side and slop at a uh, sloping roof on the other, with only rafters for footing. The analogy is a straightforward one. The passageway, with its various doors leading into the attics of individual homes, is evidence that such a hallway exists in the highest realm. Platonically speaking, that would be Plato, the passage and the various rooms connected to it, connected to the passage via the doors, are imperfect copies of their perfect form. An architect could not have thought to design them had they not already existed in the heavenly realm. Plato believed that all human knowledge is retained through recollections of the soul before it entered the human body. It's a pre-existence thing. Speaking of Plato, another obvious reference to Plato are the magic rings which the children discover in Uncle Andrew's attic after miscalculating the rafters and entering his study by accident. I see comments all the time inferring that Lewis was quote-unquote heavily borrowing from his pub buddy, Professor Tolkien, when in fact Clive and J.R.R. were tapping into the same source. In book two of his Republic, Plato offers a hypothetical magical ring which makes its wearer invisible. He calls it the Ring of Gyges, the name of the shepherd entrusted with it. Through his invisibility, Gyges seduces a queen, kills the king, and takes the kingdom. If that sounds like a setup for Queen Jadis, a.k.a. The White, the White Witch, and the killing of Aslan, then you have been reading ahead. Good job. Then again, the names Sauron, Isildur, Golem, Bilbo, Frodo, and another couple of ring bearers that I'm probably missing play into the allegory as well for all of you Lord of the Rings fans. Though, of course, Lewis and Tolkien both offer their own unique twist to the story. The moral question ultimately being posed by Plato, and of course Lewis and Tolkien, is whether a person with such a ring would misuse his power for evil deeds. There are other magical rings probably worth mentioning. One that comes to mind is the ring of uh, Shaloma, a gift he was offered by the archangel Gabriel in Testament of Solomon. Its intended purpose was to summon and ultimately control the unclean Ruakoth of the unseen realm, though. With Shaloma's fall from grace, re revenge was ultimately there. So the, the different unclean Ruakoth, the Elohim. His weakness was women. The king of Yashro had a decision to make. If he wanted to add to his rotunda of wives, hundreds of them, then the worship of Ashtoreth and Moloch was the way to go, apparently. I'm not telling you that's the way to go, but that's the decision he made. So, like Gygus afterwards, it is the ring which empowered him to ultimately make evil decisions. It gave him a power that uh, went, you know, went the wrong way. I should also, uh, I should also mention, I didn't write this in here, but Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan is a person that has a lot of our interest right now, and he had a magical ring that he rode into battle and apparently helped them conquer the realm. And, you know, it's interesting that some people say that Solomon's ring, uh, if, if, if anyone were to wear Solomon's ring, if it were to be discovered and if he were to wear it, he would become king of the world. So it's kind of interesting that Genghis Khan also had a ring, that, uh, a ring of power that allowed him to conquer the world. Just throwing that out there. The rings in the magician's nephew also created invisibility in such a way that they transported the wearer from the shadow world to the world of forms, from the passageway with its various doors and connecting, connecting attic spaces to the ultimate wood between worlds in the higher realm. And I should mention, these, these rings were likewise a morality test for everyone involved. Diggory failed the pop quiz, but then narrowly passed the final. Contrarily, they were a complete and utter disaster for Uncle Andrew. 
What seems obvious is that Uncle Andrew employed Plato's morality tale as his inspiration and springboard, not in the way Plato intended it. But then unlike Gyges, he was not only incapable of seducing the queen, though that was most certainly his intent, he ultimately succumbed to a dumb beast in the presence of the king, whom he had hoped to steal from. And of course, the king in this scenario was the creator, Aslan, the creator of Narnia. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm wondering if the wood between the worlds is, in actuality, Aslan's country, which won't be experienced again until the voyage of the Dawn Treader. In that story, Aslan's country is described as the outlaying continent, the outer ring, if you will, far beyond the sea of a flat and circular, motionless realm. Just as a reminder that the Narnia books takes place in a, on a flat earth. Much like the undying lands of Middle Earth, we eventually come to learn in the silver chair that it is the land where the Ruakoth of dead souls, so long as they be good souls, go when they die. By the way, the undying lands exist on the Elven High Road beyond globe maps, according to Tolkien, seeing as how Middle Earth was also created to be a flat earth realm. I have literally written a book on the actual place which Lewis and Tolkien fantasize about in the hidden wilderness. There's a link for for you there. You can pick it up in, in the store at the Unexpected Cosmology. And I have a chapter in there talking about uh, Tolkien and how Middle Earth, it started out flat and then it exoterically, it became a globe, which is a lame uh, kind of plot point, but esoterically it's brilliant. Uh, the the undying lands could only be found on a flat earth map. And that makes total sense because the realm is much larger than a globe allows for. Yes, I am fully convinced that it does exist, this hidden wilderness, even more so than the multiverse, something that you know I've been putting a lot of research into. And it could be a deception of NASA, but uh, it could be legitimate. There could be something really to this. Now that I'm thinking about it, I may just make this and add a chapter in, in the Hidden Wilderness book. Here is another spoiler alert. Everyone dies by the end of the Chronicles of Narnia. Yes, even the children. Well, the exception of Susan. She she doesn't die, but then again, she doesn't go to Aslan's country either. She you know got really into makeup. The reason I am inevitably suggesting that the wood between the worlds is Aslan's country is because we come to learn in Lewis's final entry, The Last Battle, that the true form of all worlds in the multiverse are physically connected to it, to Aslan's country, which is a stand-in for heaven. In quantum terms, everything that we experience here in our perceived reality is but a shadow emanating from the flame. And as you know, the darkness doesn't recognize the light. We may be inhabiting a matrix-like construct, but here is some good news. The blueprint is proof of the greater reality. Well, it is in Aslan's country, the heavenly realm, where the resurrected kings and queens can navigate to each and every one of the true world forms. In the past, I would have mocked the very notion that Lewis placed London, the actual city of London, in heaven. How very ignorant I was. London, as many of you are aware, was an actual millennial kingdom city, as was Lewis and Tolkien's hangout at Oxford. Oxford is a beautiful city. All signs point to the likelihood, if not fact, that they were built by the ruling kings and priests of the kingdom. I'm actually preparing a, a paper right now on the creation of the building of Oxford. It only makes logical sense that what we have is a copy of the form, meaning that what we have, the London we have, the Oxford we have, they are but the shadow land. They are not the true London, the true Oxford. The two Oxford professors were in deep, I tell you, deep. With all that we've been through, the various puddles which Diggory discovers in the wood between the worlds is what actually prompted me to finalize this paper. And that's because of the uh, Philip K. Dick uh, multiverse Mandela effect, a millennial kingdom paper that I just wrote a couple days ago that sparked my interest in this again. And that was, of course, the last video that I put out. Seeing as how each puddle is the entrance way to another world, the entire scenario, the, the entire scenario screams of the multiverse. There is more to it than that, though. 
you will have to forgive me for showing you a cartoon drawing of replicated globes. There they are right there. And then pay attention to the illustration on the right. You have to forgive me for the drawing of replicated globes when in fact our realm is a flat and motionless one, a gestation womb within the firmament. It's why I'm also including an illustration of biblical cosmology, though not even this attempt at capturing Elohim's description of creation gets it all right. And that, that's okay. What I want you to take particular notice of is the waters above the firmament. So if you're unfamiliar with Hebrew cosmology, uh, here is the earth. Hopefully my mouse is, my mouse is not showing that. Uh, well, here is the, the, you can see the solid firmament and water above that water. It goes all the way around to the great deep below the earth. The waters above are masculine. The, the waters below are feminine. There is an ocean of water above us as well as below the masculine and the feminine heaven or the platonic world of forms is positioned directly above the ocean held up by the firmament. There is the wood between the worlds and your puddle. After Diggory put on the magic ring, he vanished from our world and was pulled up through the water into the sunlit world above. Water. Take a mental note of that. I'm jumping around in the narrative somewhat, but on one such trip through the ethereal ocean, Diggory said he could see the stars as well as an up-close and personal view of Jupiter, even a moon of Jupiter up close, reminding us that the stars as well as the planets, the wandering stars, are twinkling lights in the heavenly ocean. They are also divine beings, conscious beings, and even Lewis gets into that in other Narnian entries. I won't be covering that today, maybe if I develop this series further. Rather than seeing the multiverse as an infinite number of swirling bubble-like globes, I much prefer the wood between the worlds analogy. We haven't the faintest clue how large heaven truly is. As longitude and lati uh, latitude lines go, it might be infinite. Likewise, for all we know, there may be an infinite number of firmaments which might be viewed from above, with entire cosmologies contained within. This would be a good moment to mention there are literal cosmologies contained within each puddle in the magician's nephew, indicating just how small a place our construct is from the heavenly perspective. It all fits within Lewis's idea of the micro versus macro reality of truth. Aslan's country is referred to in The Last Battle as the layers of an onion. The onion itself is a kind of gnosis. Dissecting one is wet-eyed business. I mean, we've all cut up an onion before, right? And so try not to cry when I tell you that the peel of the onion becomes larger and larger as you continue unraveling it. Actually, the phrase employed by the residents of Aslan's country is further up and further in. By comparison of the seasoned traveler, even Aslan's country is a small place upon first entry. But then it expands growing ever larger and larger, cyclically repeating its exponential growth, as though a multitude of dimensions are being overlaid upon the heavenly traveler's gnosis. It is a repeated theme throughout Lewis's literary multiverse. You will have to read The Great Divorce to find out how small Sheol truly is. The protagonist of that book purchases a bus ticket which leads him from hell to heaven. Call it a field trip, if you will. By the end of the story, the unnamed narrator comes to learn that hell is a tiny micro-sized speck, just a little itty-bitty thing, barely visible to the naked eye. And even that realization, mind you, is observed from the outer rims of heaven. One of the puddles which Diggory and Polly jump into happens to be the dead and darkened world of Charn. The illustrations provided by Pauline Barnes are indeed telling. I'll give you a second just to, to look at those. Tell me what you see. What we happen to see is the children wandering ruinous streets that look very much like Millennial Kingdom architecture. They even pause to stare up and appreciate what has become known to many of us as a symbol of greater tartary, the griffin. So fun with facts, because I'm the dealer for all your latest party talk needs. 
Aside from the various flags and banners which the griffin can be found upon throughout Tartarian society, Herodotus, Pliny the Elder, and other historians of antiquity speak of their historical existence as having physically existed in the Far East, as does Book of Britain in the Colburn. And we just uh, read that as a group. They are described as being monogamous. That's interesting. Choosing a single mate for its lifetime. So even after the mate dies, the griffin never remarries. We are told they... And I just got ahead of myself there. We are told they never remarried after their spouse after their spouse died. The gold found under their nest suggests alchemy as well as knowledge. There was, and this is also interesting. There was also the house of Griffin, though they did not receive their family name until the short season. It appears as though the Griffin dynasty were rulers in Pomerania during the millennium which was a subsection of greater Tartary, and that they fell from power either at the end of the Millennial Kingdom or almost immediately afterwards. After wandering the avenues and alleyways, Diggory and Polly stumble upon a grand hall containing the wax-like and lifeless figures of royals, all wearing crowns upon their heads. Who are these mysterious individuals? Former residents of the fallen Tartarian Kingdom, I shouldn't wonder. Only one among them returns to consciousness, though, Queen Jadis. She would, of course, be the White Witch. Her awakening comes after Diggory bumbles his spiritual aptitude test, made possible by the magic ring, and hammers a forbidden bell. The reason he beat the bell, despite Polly's pleas that he not, and they argue about it, has something to do with the plaque, which stated that he would grow old with madness, wanting to know what would have what would have happened if he had beat the bell. And so the ringing of the bell certified a twofold event. Not only did the white witch return to power, like Satan released from the abyss, so too did the once great kingdom of Charn crumble. Now, what I wish I had developed a little bit more in this was the idea that when you get into the enlightenment, you're past the dark ages now, and you get into the enlightenment, all of a sudden the occult is coming out uh, with a lot of esoteric imagery and language that seems to be directed at uh, the anticipation of Satan's release from the abyss. And so here's the kicker. Jadis tells them she had been entombed in the Hall of Images for, wait for it, a thousand years. What are the odds? It's almost like Lewis is trying to tell us something, but you know how it goes. The normies are always claiming that I'm reading too much into it. In a rather humorous turn of events, Queen Jadis is let loose in the streets of London of all places. Another coincidence, I'm sure. The eschatological Tartars may have certain ideas regarding greater Tartary, but my research has led me to suspect Britain was the happening place, maybe even ground zero for the thousand-year reign. You can read why I've come to those conclusions here in a link, Cities of the Millennial Kingdom. That was a video I put out last year, so good luck finding that in the feed. It was in Normandy, France, just across the English Channel, where Satan was defeated by Michael and thrown into the abyss on the first go-round. The location of his capture was memorialized with the construction of Mont Saint Michel, a beautiful place, and one of the greatest places I've ever been. The battle was over Britain. And so, is it any wonder that the Satan character would return for the fight immediately after arriving in our realm? To London. Her victory over London is a stalemate in this instance though she finds much greater success upon entering Narnia, by which she, Diggory, Polly, Uncle Andrew, as well as a couple new characters, the, uh, a cabbie and his horse, the horse's name is Strawberry, all experience its creation through the vibrations sung by its creator, the lion Aslan. I would argue, and in fact have written a paper on this one as well, that a Satan-like creature was confined in the abyss during the Genesis reset event to which you have just been linked to another paper. And here is another one, Mud Fossils. Look into that as well, if you haven't already. 
To say Beer Sheath Chapter 1 was a creation event is not nearly so accurate as describing it as a recreation event. Why so many are hard-pressed and denying that very obvious fact is beyond me. I mean, I, I started looking into the idea that Genesis 1 was a recreation event 20, 30 years ago. It just, it read that way to me. And I would bring this up to pastors, you know, and seminary students and like, no, 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 no. That, 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 that view is called the gap there and it's been defeated a hundred years ago. I'm like, okay, all right. And I, you know, I had no choice, I guess, but just to believe the alternative that the earth is less than 6,000 years old. So let me restress this again. The old world was destroyed by one means or another, flood water mostly. A new one was built using the geological column as its foundation. Much as our own present world was reshaped over the ruins of the kingdom and the mud flood. And of course, melted cities as well. Reset events such as these occur cyclically and will undoubtedly happen again. At any rate, using an inhabitant of Charn to explain the origins of evil within Narnia is a clever sleight of hand to avoid the usual lifted eyebrows among evangelicals. Then again, since a plurality of worlds is the underlying theme, who is to say that Hasatan is not another character from another Earth, another dimension in the multiverse? I mean, why not? One last thing before ending my discourse for the day. I've drunk my coffee, eaten breakfast as well as lunch, and am well on my way to the dinner hour. Actually, now this is my third attempt at making this video, so hopefully it sticks the landing. Very soon my workday will expire, and Sarah will be handing Rivka, our beautiful toddler daughter, over to dad duties. I can't wait. I started out telling you that the writer's strike was over. That would be the writer's block. There is far too much to cover in other areas of my life to invest a second day on this one, the Narnia Reset, at least for now. Not that it wasn't important or anything, or else I wouldn't have done it. It's just that I think the point was made. Perhaps I can revisit the Narnia Reset again on another occasion. Is that the title I've settled upon? I guess so. Anyways, to my last point. The London cabbie driver became Frank I, the very first king of Narnia. His descendants later ruled from Arkenland to the south. Likewise, we are reminded that Adam was created outside of paradise and then placed into it. The reason why is that he was expected to rule as high king and priest over humanity, the pre-Adamites. My research has led me to conclude that Adam lived many years seeking Elohim's righteous ways before he was selected to rule as man's representative, much like the London cabbie. So what I'm saying is, is that Adam wasn't just created and then like within the first day, he just ends up in paradise. I'm saying he might have lived many years. I think that's very possible. Frank's wife, Helen, though I think he called her Nellie, was then brought into Narnia to rule at his side. What does that remind you of? Chua, or Eve as most people know her, was not so dissimilar. Nearly everyone is hung up on the rib passage for her origin story. There's nothing wrong with that. I am convinced, however, that she too was a pre-existing soul, actually a, a, a Ruakov, going about her business before her marriage to Adam, though I have yet to show my readers to why that is. I do have my source. More on that some other time then, I guess.